articulating. Let me start by saying that I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person this month, but of course we're living in strange times. So I thought that I would try something that my husband and I have been talking about, and that is giving you a recorded lecture. Feel free to watch this numerous times, share it with other people, um, or just have it on in the background for noise because you're lonely. Anyway, we're going to talk today about Spanish art. Um, let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to start with um, the difference between Baroque and Rococo. So for those of you that are familiar with music, Baroque music is um, compositions by Bach or by George Friedrich Handel, so things like the Messiah, and you've probably heard music like that before. Um, Bach and the Baroque are a particular period in time, okay, and they run roughly in the first half almost to the late part of the 1600s, and that's the same time period as Baroque art, okay, and Baroque art is classified as um, showing an interest in the common man, um, showing um, little emotion, not a lot. There's a lot of imagination being used. Um, there's a lot of nature and man's awe of nature. Um, so those are elements that we might see in Baroque. And then um, if we skip ahead to Rococo or Romantic, we're talking about much more ornate much more decorated, a lot more detail. Um, in music, that would be classified with a lot thicker chords. Think of um, Brahms or Schumann or Beethoven. Um, much thicker sound than Bach from the Baroque era. Um, and the art is the same way. The art has a lot of emotion. It's much more extreme. Um, and it does show the everyman, but it shows the everyman in everyday um, activities. So we're going to focus on some of those differences. Um, the other big difference is that artists start to use chiaroscuro. And we've talked about chiaroscuro before. Chiaroscuro is a fancy Italian word for contrast. So we're talking about artists that have light and dark contrast um, in very strong ways in their work. And we'll see a lot of that as well. So that's um, kind of a brief definition of Baroque and of Rococo or Romantic era. Um, so we're going to talk about Diego Velazquez, and we're going to talk about Francisco Goya, um, both of whom are very prominently known Spanish artists of their day. Um, this happens to nicely tie in with the exhibit that's currently at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, The Glory of Spain. And I did go walk through that the other day, and I would look forward to being able to walk all of you through that at some point in time. Um, I think the exhibition is there through May. Um, and it definitely has works by Velazquez and works by Goya in the exhibition, along with a lot of other artists. Um, but certainly this lecture would help to prepare you for that viewing, okay? Um, so Diego Velazquez. Diego Velazquez is born in 1599. He dies in 1660, and of course he is Spanish. He's the oldest of six children, and he's born in Sevilla. Um, he never really lives outside of Spain, and eventually he moves out of Sevilla and into Madrid, but we're going to get there in a moment. Um, his parents recognize that he has some talent in art, and like many other um, students of the day, there's no art school for him to go to, so his parents apprentice him to another artist, who of course would have been a craftsman back in those days. So even if you're a painter, you're really painting for a purpose. You're not just painting for pretty pictures. You're painting for the church, or you're painting for a patron, or you're painting uh, the walls of something as decoration. So they apprentice him to Francisco de Herrera, another Spanish artist. Um, and then by tw the age of 12, they have now moved him to apprentice for Francisco Pacheco. And the reason it's important to know that is for two things. One, Pacheco had excellent contacts with the royal family. So even back then, um, these guys needed their contacts in order to make a career. The other reason is that Velazquez ends up marrying Pacheco's daughter and stays married to her for his 40 years on this earth. So um, those are both two important points to note. Um, Velazquez, like most people of the day, would have initially started training um, 
with religious themes. Um, that was what the prescribed artwork of the day would have been. But then he actually decides that he's very interested in the common man. And so he starts to paint what we call our genre pictures. You might remember from our toast points that the first T in toast stands for type. What type of art are we looking at? Are we looking at a portrait or a still life or a landscape or a genre picture? And a genre picture, of course, is just an everyday life scene. Um, in Spain, there was a particular type of genre picture. It was called a bodregon. Sounds kind of like bodega. And what would you buy at a bodega? Cameraman, what would we buy at a bodega? Groceries. Groceries, exactly. So food products or necessities. And so in this case, bodregon is a person in an everyday situation, generally with food. So here's a good example of a bodregon. I apologize, it's not a reproduction, but we have a book here. Um, and this picture is uh, non-creatively titled, Old Woman Frying Eggs. Okay, so even if I didn't tell you that, you'd probably put that one together, right? So what do we have here? Well, we have our good use of chiaroscuro, like I talked about. We have a very, very strong, dark background, and we have a lot of light on the subject matter of the picture both the people and the dishes and the eggs, of course. So we have old woman frying eggs. Let's see, this one was painted in 1618. Okay, so he's still pretty early on in his career. He's not even 20 years old yet. And old woman frying eggs is different because of the subject matter and because he uses a lot of contour on these people to make them look pretty realistic. Um, if you move in a little bit closer on this, you can see that the woman has a fair amount of um, wrinkles. There's a lot of depth to her material on her dress and on her, on her headscarf. Um, remember, we've talked about heads and hands being two of the more difficult things. Um, but in this particular case, he does a pretty good job painting the heads and the hands. And of course, then we have our eggs here in the dish. And so Old Woman Frying Eggs is a pretty easy apropos title in this case. Um, so he's painting these genre pictures and he becomes uh, well connected with the king, thanks to Pacheco, whose daughter he's now married to. And he becomes the royal painter to the king. Um, eventually, he's going to become the Chamberlain. Sorry about that. As you can tell, we're filming at home and we've got dogs. Um, eventually, he's going to become the Chamberlain to the king, which is basically the chief of staff of the day. So he's going to become very important in the royal life. Um, but for now, he's just going to be the court painter. And that's okay, because he's going to get paid very handsomely to be the court painter. So it all works out pretty well for him. Um, in 1628, Paul Rubens comes to town, and he stays for about six months in the royal court, and he and Diego Velazquez become friends. And Rubens says, hey, you should go to Italy, and you should go study the masters, and you should go look at what's happening in Italy, because the kind of painting that y'all are doing here in Spain is very different than what we have in Italy. And Velazquez thinks that sounds like a pretty good idea. The king, King Philip, says, you know what, that would be fine. You can go to Italy and you can study up, but I'd also like you to buy and bring back some artwork for my royal palaces. So I personally would love that gig. I would be more than happy to go to Italy and start buying art for somebody else's collection. So Velazquez is pretty happy with that assignment and off he goes and sure enough he studies Italian painting and the way that things are being put together. He collects a bunch of art, he brings it back to King Philip and that is going to become the basis for the Prado collection later in time. Um, while he's in Italy he connects with the uh, Roman Catholic Church and he is assigned the um, commission to paint Pope Innocent X. So, meet Pope Innocent X. Um, this was painted in 1650, um, and he becomes the painter for the papal court while he's there. Okay, So I've already kind of given it away a little bit. I've told you that this is a picture of the Pope. 
But how would we know that? If you were sitting in front of me right now, we'd have a little Q&A like we always did. Um, and some of the things I would like to think that you would be able to describe would be this throne or this very regal looking chair that we have the Pope positioned in. Um, the very lush looking uh, way that Velasquez has captured the fabrics that the Pope is wearing, right? They look very wealthy and plush. Um, he's in his white robe, of course, and he's got his little Pope hat on. Um, he has the ring, the royal Pope ring. He's got a document in this hand. I don't know what it is. Um, but he definitely looks like a guy that's in control, right? He looks like a powerful, wealthy individual. Both, both of those things are characteristics that he has. Um, but the thing that's perhaps the most jarring about this picture is his expression. Um, the eyes are very penetrating and very serious. Um, he doesn't look like a guy that you'd want to go and have a beer with, right? He looks very intense and sober and somber. Um, so much so that the Pope actually gets a little upset at this picture. He says that it's too realistic. It's too true. But then he kind of comes around and he decides that, you know, this is actually a masterful capture of my personality and the way that I am being perceived. And so he did win over the Pope's favor. Um, Velasquez takes a picture of this or a copy of this back to Spain and it does become a study that other artists copy. Now, this is another picture of the Pope. Um, this, however, was not done by Velasquez. It's very dark, as you can see. Um, this was done by Francis Bacon, who, shameless plug, also has an exhibition at the MFA right now. So I thought it was kind of interesting that we talked about both of these guys because they're both at the MFA. Um, Francis Bacon was a contemporary artist. He was Irish, but he spent most of his career in Great Britain. And this is a very um, typical painting for Francis Bacon. Again, we have a very serious, dark, somber composition. And this one actually was not only influenced by the Pope, but it's actually titled that it was influenced by Pope Innocent X. Um, if you hold the two together, I'll put this up here, and I'll hold this one, um, we can see that the positioning of the two men is very similar, right? They're both sitting in these chairs. We can see it very faintly in this one. Um, that they're both kind of, even though he's got his leg up on his knee, um, the, this, the positioning of them both is pretty similar. Um, obviously, the expression on Bacon's is much different. It's very anguished and horrified. Um, and that was very typical of a Bacon painting. Uh, Bacon, Bacon was a very tortured soul. He was um, alcoholic. He was a party guy. He was a homosexual living in Great Britain at a time that homosexuality was illegal. Um, so that's all I want to say about Bacon right now, but I did want you to realize that Velazquez's influence on other painters was very important. Um, additionally, he was a strong influence on uh, Picasso. Picasso did 57 versions of one of Velazquez's works. We're going to talk about that work next. This is perhaps Diego Velazquez's best known work. In real life, this is about nine foot by 10 foot. It is a very, very large picture. In fact, it's so large, it's almost immersive. Um, it's displayed at the Prado in Madrid. And when you walk into the room, into the gallery where they have this, um, I've been privileged enough to see it in person. It is so large that you almost feel like you've walked into the room with all of these people. Okay. So this one is called Las Meninas, which trans, um, translates to Maids of Honor. Um, we definitely have two Maids of Honor here in the picture. Don't know why that was the particular title that he chose, because if you look at this picture, that's probably not the first thing you notice. Um, but this was painted in 1656, we think. Um, and it's basically a royal family portrait. So we're using a genre um, style of picture, but we're using the royal family in an everyday life situation. 
This had never been done before. Usually the royal family would be painted in very regal positioning, in lots of lush colors and lush wardrobe and, you know, in these very noble positionings, kind of like our Pope. But in this case, we have an everyday, almost chaotic, uh, kinetic kind of scene going on here with a lot of characters, okay? So, whoop, almost tripped over the dog. So let's talk our way through this picture, okay? Interestingly enough, the first thing you'll notice is our little Princess Margarita here. And she's the centerpiece of the picture. We don't know whether this was actually meant to be a portrait of Margarita or whether Margarita was brought in to entertain her parents who were sitting for the portrait. How do we know that? Because here are mom and dad reflected in the mirror. So we have Prince Philip and his queen, and they're basically where you are right now, viewer. Margarita is looking at the king and queen who are sitting over there. We don't know whether she was brought in to entertain them because they were bored. Maybe they were bored because they were sitting for Velasquez, who is right over here on the left of the picture. So we have Velasquez who has put himself in this picture. Interesting, right? And here we have this ginormous canvas that he's painting on. So I've told you that this is a very large picture and we can definitely deduce that this is probably this picture. So we're actually looking at a picture of a picture in a picture. So we have Velasquez here painting his picture. Um, he's got the tools of his trade. He's got his palette and his brushes here. One interesting thing, he's got this bright red cross on his chest. And I read two different accountings of that red cross. The red cross stands for knighthood. This picture was painted in 1656, but Velazquez was not named to a knight until 1659. So was he painting this as a suggestion? Or was this red cross added later? And we really don't know which. So that's kind of a little mystery of this picture. Um, so we have Princess Margarita, we have King and Queen, we have Velasquez here, and we have our two ladies in waiting. We have one here who's offering water. And we have a slightly older one, maybe a teenager, who's also part of this. In the background here, we have the Chamberlain. Remember I said Velasquez is later going to become the Chamberlain or Chief of Staff, but that's a high position of honor. And so I think Velasquez included him in this picture because he's an important part of the royal family. Um, additionally, we have two other people who would be uh, members of the royal court. This one is dressed like a nun. I don't know for sure if it's really a nun, but we'll go with that. We'll say it's a nun and one of the men. Um, and then we have this dwarf, and this is a dwarf. Velazquez was known for painting dwarves in a very favorable way. Up to this point, when dwarves were painted, they were almost painted as weirdos or ghoulish. Um, and dwarfs were often used in the royal court because I think they were special. So in this case, he's actually treated the um, painting of the character, the dwarf, in a pretty, pretty nice way. She's actually well-dressed. She's part of the royal family. Um, and then we have our jester over here. And the court jester actually is a boy, even though um, he has long hair and looks kind of feminine in this picture, but it is a young boy. He's got his foot playfully up on the family dog. Okay, so we've talked about all the characters in this picture. We also have two pictures here on the wall. Very, very dark, hard to tell what the subject matter is. Allegedly, they are paintings by Rubens. But I also read an accounting that said that those may have been pictures painted by Velazquez's brother-in-law. So who knows, maybe a little nepotism in there, maybe not. Um, so if you take this whole picture as a whole, you're looking at a family scene, right? A genre picture of the royal family. This had never been done before. This is a big deal. And again, we have very strong chiaroscuro here. We have a lot of light on the bottom half of this picture. Look what happens if I do that. We don't have anything going on in the top half of that picture, do we? very little. So if we take that away, we can see that there's a very strong contrast. And again, because this picture is so large, 
when you see it in real life, it's very immersive and almost life-size. So it's very easy to get uh, brought into this scene. Um, Picasso repaints this picture 58 times in a very abstract Picasso cubist type of way. So you can look that up online if you're getting wild and crazy. Uh, just pull up Picasso Las Meninas and you'll see many interpretations of what he did there. Um, Velasquez stays with the royal court for his whole life. Um, he dies, as I said, in, what did I say? He dies in 1660. Um, he is not known outside of Spain until well after his death. And he's really only known outside of Spain at that point because a Scottish artist is touring in Spain several years later, finds Velasquez's work, and brings it back to his home country. So that's how come we know about him. Uh, Velasquez only made 162 known paintings during his lifetime, 111 of which survive today. Okay, there we go. Any questions? Huh, no questions. And if there are, sorry. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to Goya after a very brief intermission. Hi. Okay, I'm back. Um, now we're going to talk about Francisco Goya. Francisco Goya was born in 1746, died in 1828, also Spanish, of course. Um, and he is often considered to be one of the first modern artists of the old masters. Okay, So he's working during a time of romanticism, so that heavier, more emotional type of work that we talked about earlier. Um, He's going to try to move away from the traditional court paintings, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, he is an excellent printmaker. He does a whole series of prints, um, very prolific. He um, uses a lot of women as subject matter in his work. Um, he does a um, series of wall paintings late in his life that we wouldn't have known about had we never discovered his old cabin with these wall paintings that they've now been able to extract. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, he's born in Spain, in Aragon, uh, to the lower class, a little different than what was going on with Velazquez. Um, he's barely literate. He has very poor schooling, so he never actually gets a strong education. Um, but he does begin art study at age 14. Uh, mostly as a copyist, and we've talked about other artists that did that, where they were brought in to copy the works of old masters. So I think Goya actually spent some time copying the works of Velazquez. Um, he moves to Madrid at age 18, and he tries to get into the Spanish Academy, but he is refused twice. Later on, he's going to get the last laugh because he ends up the head of the Spanish Academy, but initially they say no bueno. Um, he moves to Italy in 1770 to study the old masters, just like everybody. And then he goes back to Spain about a year later and studies with Francesco Bayou. And he ends up marrying Bayou's daughter, a story that we heard before with Velazquez. Um, in 1774, he is commissioned to make a series of work for tapestries. And it's almost a set of cartoons. Um, I have a couple examples. So this would have been kind of what you would have seen in tapestries that were meant to hang on the walls of the palace. So you can see that the faces are not meant to be realistic. They're kind of cartoony. The colors are real bright and cheerful. They're engaged in kind of a silly activity. And that would have been what you would have seen in tapestries to decorate the palace. Now, if I show you this, the picture over here shows a little more of that cartoony quality, but over time, his style is going to evolve to this, this much darker, more serious, somber type of work. So we're going to see the evolution from silly to somber over time. Okay. Um, he starts to get portrait commissions. This is terrific. And in 1796, he gets asked to paint portraits of the Duke and Duchess of Alba. Now, in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, one of the 
um, stars of the exhibition is one of the portraits of the Duchess of Alba. So in my book here, I have two portraits. The one here is the Duchess of Alba in her white dress. She's looking very innocent and pretty. Um, she's got her little pet dog in the picture. Things are terrific. There's actually a companion work of the Duke that was painted at around the same time. And Goya becomes very friendly with the Duke and Duchess. Within a year, the Duke has passed away. So the Duchess is then painted in her black, right? And she's painted with a little bit of a different expression, a little more sober. But there are a couple of strange things about this portrait. For one thing, we look at her hand, and her hand is pointing down to the ground. And if you were able to look closely down on the ground, she is pointing at the word Goya, which is in the sand on the dirt. Well, what is that supposed to mean? Well, we also know that she's wearing two rings in this picture. One says Alba, and the other says Goya. So there was a lot of talk about Goya and the Duchess having a little something something on the side going on here. Um, and Goya actually kept this portrait for his whole life. So we know that there was definitely an intimacy, if not beyond that, um, at the time. But it was never proven one way or the other. But people like to make a big deal out of that. So um, he continues to gain commissions. And um, he's asked to paint some frescoes on the sides of the church, the San Antonio de la Florida. Um, and around the same time, people are becoming very interested in uh, mythology and in witchcraft and in topics that didn't appear normally in art. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Um, he starts a series of etchings called Los Caprichos. And capricho basically means a sudden change in mood or behavior. Okay? So he makes about 80 etchings in this series. This would be the best known piece in the series. Okay? And this one, the short name, is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. Okay? And this might be an image that you've seen before, a familiar image. Um, we have text down here. And if we were to read the whole text, it would say, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Imagination abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters. United with her, she is the mother of the arts and the source of their wonders. And that text is written by Goya. Okay? He does 80 of these pictures, and they have all different strange, um, creepy, ghostly, um, horrifying images in them, and they all have titles. Um, in this one, we have a man who's sleeping, presumably Goya. We have an owl. We have bats flying around in the background, another owl over here. We have a lynx cat down here, and all of the creatures in the picture are awake, right? But of course, the man here looks like he's sleeping. Um, I have a correction to make. I have been telling all of you that when we do our toast points, that the A in toast stands for allegorical or realistic. And my explanation for allegorical up to this point had been that allegorical meant pretend or imaginary. I don't think that's actually accurate. When I was studying up for this lecture, the, the definition of allegory that I found to be perhaps more appropriate is that allegory means that there are symbols that represent things. So this is an excellent example of an allegorical picture. We have the owl, which represents wisdom or things that people know. We have the bats that at the time um, represented witchcraft and things that were mysterious and dark. We have our lynx which represents being cautious and careful. So we have a lot of that allegory going on in this picture, right? Um, so he made this series of 80 etchings, and he had 300 sets of them printed for sale. And they were selling at a reasonable price, but only 27 of those sets sold. Well, okay, what are we gonna do with the other 230 or 270 sets? So. Goya figures out, okay, I got it. I'm gonna gift the 270 sets that didn't sell to the king. 
And in exchange for my gift, the king is going to agree to provide a pension to my family for the rest of their lives. And the king actually goes for this. So we know for a fact about the number of sets of etchings because all of the ones that went unsold went back to the king. Um, he makes two other series, large series of etchings. One is called Follies, one is called Proverbs. And again, their titles um, and their text come directly from him. So some of them look like this. Um, they all have text at the bottom. An example here, uh, one of them is called Nobody Knows Himself. And he says, the world is a masquerade. Face, dress, and voice all are false. All wish to appear what they are not. All deceive and do not even know themselves. So he's a pretty dark guy, right? A um, little cynical and negative. Um, some of that comes because he has um, several health problems. He falls very, very ill, and in his first bout with this serious illness, he loses his hearing, and he becomes deaf. As the deafness has sunk in, he starts to withdraw from society because he really feels like he's not a part of things. He stays a member of the royal court, a paid member of the royal court, but he's definitely starting to withdraw from public life. Around that same time, um, the Napoleonic invasion takes place. We've talked about the fact that historical context is very important in art. And in this particular case, it becomes even more so. The Napoleonic conflict, of course, is Napoleon basically raiding Spain and wanting to take over. Uh, Napoleon, I think, puts his brother in charge of the Spanish court. Goya doesn't want to make waves. He stays a part of the Spanish court during this and kind of waits it out until the end when the Spanish uh, royals are able to come back in. But social issues are weighing heavily on the public um, and on Goya. He feels that he, he um, needs to express himself and to show what's happening in his country. Now, he waits until after the conflict has been resolved, but he saves up his images and he creates two paintings. One is called The Second of May. 1808, and the other is called the 3rd of May, 1808. This is called the 3rd of May, 1808. He painted it in 1814 after the conflict had resolved. Um, and oftentimes the two pictures will be shown together, but in this case, this I think is the more iconic image. Um, for the first thing we notice, the, the portrayal of the people is much more of a cartoony kind of portrayal. He doesn't have, you know, contours in their face. He's not trying to make the people look realistic like you would in a commissioned portrait. He's really painting a scene, right? I'm not sure I'd call it a genre scene because this is not an everyday occurrence, although at the time it may have been. Um, so what do we have here? We have a strong use of chiaroscuro, just like we did with Velasquez, right? We have a lot of dark and strong light. The light images in this one certainly bring your eye to what's going on in the middle of the picture. Um, we have our character here with the white shirt. What does a white shirt typically symbolize? A white shirt would typically symbolize purity or innocence, um, peace, right? So we have this man with his arms outstretched. Um, anybody recognize the position of the man with his arms outstretched? Similar to the crucifixion. So we have some symbolism going on here. And the man definitely has a look of terror on his face, right? So why is he looking terrified? He's looking terrified because we have these gentlemen over here, right? Um, anonymous faces. We can't see who they are. We can assume that these are French soldiers and they have their guns and they are about to execute this gentleman. How can we tell? Well, we have other bodies of executed people lying around on the ground. Um, but this is being done with anonymous accountability, right? So we have our French soldiers here aiming their guns at the Spanish. We have lots of Spanish individual faces and expressions of horror and concern and alarm and confusion going on. We have our light source down here, right? This is a night scene. Um, we have the city in the background, 
And we can't see anything happening at the city. The city is very quiet. So maybe the city just sat and waited and didn't do anything about these kinds of alarming scenes, right? So this is a pretty um, powerful picture, don't you think? You don't have to know anything about the Napoleonic invasion to understand that this is not good. This guy is definitely distressed and he's about to lose his life thanks to these anonymous soldiers. So to me, this is a very, very strong portrayal of a social issue picture. We've talked about the importance of social issues in today's art, and I think that this was really why Goya is considered to be one of the first modern masters, because he's taking the events of the day and putting them into his art. Um, so after this happens, he um, becomes ill again, very seriously. Um, he almost dies. He decides it's time to leave the royal court and go off and live in his in his uh, cabin on the outskirts of Madrid. Um, as you recall, he was already, had already arranged for a pension to be continuously paid, so he didn't have to interact with people anymore at that point. And he moves out to a home, and he starts to paint on the walls of the home. He paints a series of 14 pictures, um, eight downstairs and six upstairs in his home, on the walls, so in a fresco-like fashion. And one of them is called The Witch's Sabbath. So remember, we had talked about, how's that? We had talked about the fact that witchcraft had become important and interesting to people at the time. Um, but this is a very dark picture. Again, we have some allegory going on here. We have this he goat um, subject matter. Um, it's obviously some sort of mythical reference, um, and he's kind of the leader of what's going on in this gathering of people. But can you imagine wanting to paint this on your wall and live with this? I mean, the guy is obviously kind of losing it. He's depressed and painting these dark pictures on his wall and living with them. He doesn't expect anybody to ever see these works except for himself, and he's clearly in a very dark place. So we don't discover these works until Goya is dead, um, and then they are able to peel these works off the walls of his home, um, but we lose some of the detail work, and we lose a couple feet, I believe, off of the right side of this picture in the removal. So there was more to this. But there were 14 of these pictures, and he lived with them. They're referred to as the black paintings. Okay? Um, another part of this series is one that you may have seen before. Blah, right? This one is called Devouring His Son. Uh, Saturn, Devouring His Son. Pretty grotesque, right? We have the god Saturn um, with his son having been beheaded, who he's eaten. Again, not the picture that you would paint if you were kind of all there. So we have these horrible pictures that he's living with all around him, and he never expected for those works to be part of the display. Um, this concludes our talk today. I hope that it gave you a pleasant diversion. I will sincerely hope that I can be back with you next month. I hope that you all stay well and stay safe. Wash, wash, wash. And if you have any questions or have any feedback for me, I would really love to hear from you. Feel free to email me. My email address is wkaintx at gmail.com or feel free to leave comments on the YouTube site. Thanks for tuning in and I'll hope to see you soon. Bye.